Try that again. Good morning. morning. Scripture reading today is John 7, 37 through 39a. On the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowd, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may cross, come and drink of the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart when he said this living water he was speaking of the spirit so be it Can you hear me? Now you hear me? Okay. Let's bow and start in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that we can come and freely worship you. Lord, we thank you that at just the right time, while we were still sinners, Christ came and died for us. Lord, we also thank you that we know that without a doubt that Christ will return, that death has no sting for us, and that we will spend eternity with you in uh, heaven because of what Jesus Christ has done. Fill us with your spirit today, Lord. Help us to be thirsty, to be hungry, Lord, where we desire the spirit, where we take out the distractions, which are mainly ourselves and the the sinful desires that we have, and be completely filled with the spirit so that we may walk anew this new life that you have given us in Jesus Christ and be an example and and an inspiration for others so that they see Christ living in us. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I entitled this Nutrition for Life. Um, You read through 2 Timothy, and now you've started your passage through John, and I want to read a little bit um, of Timothy and give you some insight going here and kind of tie it together. If you remember Revelation, I pointed out more than anything that this was John's revelation or Jesus' revelation to seven physical churches so that they would not grow weary so that they would be instead patient so that they would endure until, until the time comes when Jesus returns and all things become new regardless of how you interpret those things along the way. And then Paul writes that letter to Timothy because he knows his time on earth is going to be over soon. So he writes to Timothy telling him the same thing to not give up the faith but to fan in the flame literally. Second Timothy 1 verses 5 through 8 and I'm going to read through these scriptures with a New Living Translation. Paul writes to Timothy, I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother. This is something that we teach our children and our grandchildren so that they will not depart from it. And we have to teach them by the way we live as well. And I know that the same faith continues strong in you. Verse 6, This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift that God has given you when I laid hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And I say those with the emphasis to, to, for us to think about those things, that the Spirit gives us power. The Spirit is what allows us to love, because without knowing God's love, we could never love. And then self-discipline, to live that holy life, to give up our lives and our evil desires and live for the Lord. So verse 8, so never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. That is the purpose of why we're still here, to be a herald, to proclaim, to be a witness, even a martyr. 2 Timothy verse, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, for God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was His plan from the beginning, before the beginning of time, to show us grace through Christ Jesus. And now he has, made all, he has made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus our Savior. Who bro- he broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. Reading on in verse 14. Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us, carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. Look at what we're reading, that Paul's words to Timothy, talking about the power of the Spirit, which Merle just read us in, in John chapter 7. And then 2 Timothy 2, verses 2 through 5, Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people 
who will be able to pass them on to others, endure surf, suffering along with me as a good soldier. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of ci civilian life, for then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. And athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. So Paul compares um, this Christian journey, this Christian w walk of faith to a soldier and to athletes, and he does it to, to that of a farmer as well. Because we understand the analogy there of a farmer that is sowing his seed to produce a crop. Then we read, started reading the Gospel of John. And as you rem read, remember who John was when we first encounter him in his walk with faith. He realized that Jesus was the Messiah. He gave up all to follow after Jesus, but he still had this mindset that I've got to get rid of, that I am who I am, and I'm saved, and I do good, and Lord, do you want me to rain down fire from heaven on all those sinful people? And now see, after you've read Revelation and you've read John over and over again, the change that John's not that person anymore. He's the disciple of love. Because the love of Christ has infected him so much that he knows that there's no righteousness found in him except what Jesus Christ has put in him. And he lives a life that proclaims and he writes this gospel so that you may believe in Jesus Christ and let him truly change you to be a child of God. So chapter 1, basically, Jesus is the light of the world and he comes into the world, but the world rejects him. But those who do accept him, they have the right to become children of God. John chapter 1, verse 10, He came into the very world He created, but the world did not recognize Him. He came to His own people, and they, even they rejected Him. But to all who believed in Him and accepted Him, He gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or, or plan, but a birth that comes from God. As you finish reading John chapter 1, John makes a declaration that Jesus, John the Baptist, not John the disciple, John the Baptist makes a declaration that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And I think about the things that I read in Revelation as I'm tying this together. Jesus appeared to be weak. He appeared to, to not confront. He appeared to not take control of the kingdom of Israel, but instead he was doing exactly what God planned. He was dying for our sins, and he will come back and reign. The lamb that becomes the lion, the lamb who is the lion the whole time. John's disciples become Jesus' disciples, and they make a declaration that, that says that this is Jesus is the one that Moses and the prophets wrote about. So we have this declaration that light has come into the world. Have you been exposed to the light? Have you seen the light? Have you let the light fill you so that you will illuminate? Or are you still kind of hanging out there like Nicodemus is as we work our way through this gospel? Where he wants to know who Jesus is. He recognizes Jesus, but he's not willing to pay the price of being a disciple. To deny yourself, to take up your cross and follow after Jesus. That your life is not your own anymore. That it belongs to Jesus because of what he's done. In chapter 2, there's a wedding celebration. What happens? They run out of wine. That means the celebration basically is over. If I'm going to be here at the wedding and the wine is gone, why am I here? The, the fun's over. But instead, Jesus even tells his mother, my time has not yet come, but performs this first sign, as John says, these signs that you, so that you believe. And John's gospel is not written like the other gospels. It's, it's written with all these signs and these I am statements and everything. So you put together who Jesus is. And will you let him change you from the way John was to the way John becomes, where you think you can do things on your own. You think that you're okay because your salvation, till you give up everything and say, I am simply a child of God because of what God has done for me. And I want to live my life for him, period. Jesus turns water into wine. And as you read that, and I'm not going to stress on it because I want to stress more on chapter 7 when we get there. It was right at that point when the water touched the, the uh, host's lips that it became wine, if you really read and study that. That faith of going out and saying, what, what are we going to do with this, these few fishes and loaves, Lord? Trust Him and watch what will happen. <clears throat> The chapter continues on where Jesus clears the temple. And the question is laid before you at the end of chapter 2, if you're reading along and understanding it, who is Jesus to you? 
The claim has been made. He's the light of the world, but are you going to let him fill you? And are you going to illuminate you? Are you going to look at things still from a worldly point of view and say, we're out of wine. What are we going to do? Are you going to walk by faith and see that what little that you do have, God will use? And the more that you pray and ask, the more that he'll fill you with the Spirit so that you can be used even more of him. So in chapter 3, we meet this religious man that comes to Jesus at night. This religious man named Nicodemus thinks he's okay in his salvation. He thinks he's fine with the things that he does. But yet, you notice that he comes to Jesus in the dark because he doesn't want his deeds exposed. He's, he knows what his true heart is. And Jesus tells him, unless you're reborn, you're born again by the Spirit, you will not see heaven, let alone enter into heaven. Do you not understand these things from the Scriptures? You've read them through and through. They're in your head, but they're far from your heart. And you're not living a life that shows that you love others because of how you're handling the law to make yourself better than others. In John chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, Jesus says, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. Jesus goes on to say that judgment is coming. I'm thinking of, of Paul's words to Timothy, and I'm thinking of Revelation. And Nicodemus, you need to decide. Are you going to stay in darkness, which you will remain in for all eternity, or are you going to come to the light? And if you truly come to the light, as James said in his letter to the churches, then your deeds will show that you obviously have repented and that you're changed. As we read on in John chapter 3, verses 19 to 21, and the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people love darkness more than light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear that their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is, what is right come to the light so that others can see that they are doing what God wants. The, the chapter ends with John's declaration again of who Jesus is and that he is the only way, the only truth, and the only life, even though that verse is not right there. That's what J John is still saying at this point. So we get into chapter 4. Now things change dramatically in this story because we're back from the religious who think that I'm somebody because of who I am in my right standing in my mind to this woman who is scandalous. And if you know any of the background, you know that that the people in, in Judea avoided the people in Samaria if they went to the people in Galilee. They went around the coast. They didn't go through Samaria. They wouldn't even go through their land because they didn't want to go around those half-breed people who were still children of Israel, but had intermarried and all these things. But the Scripture, depending on how yours reads, says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. No, he could have very well avoided Samaria. Oh, in physical thought. But in spiritual thought, again... Jesus had to go through Samaria because there was a lost woman there who was thirsty. Are you thirsty? Jesus comes to the well. He gets there, and it's a pretty good journey to get there by, by noon when he gets there. He had to walk hard, and he's tired and weary. And the disciples go on because they don't think anything about the spiritual. They think about just the physical again at this point. And they say, we've got to go to town and get some food. Jesus, you stay behind here while we get the food. And Jesus is waiting for this woman to come, this scandalous woman, because she's had several husbands, and, and she lives a lifestyle that you and I wouldn't live for sure, right? Okay, well, everything will be exposed. Let me throw that in there again. And she comes, and Jesus asks her for a drink. But you notice he, she doesn't give him the drink or anything. He talks in the physical again and says, I am thirsty physically. Will you give me a drink? Opening up the spiritual again. Because if you knew what I were offering you, you would ask me for a drink instead. Because I can give you living water. And if you receive this living water, it will quench you forever. And springs of living water will flow out of you to others. And that's exactly what happens. She tries to change the story to, oh, oh you must be a prophet and everything. I can tell that. And Jesus puts it right back at her sin and says, you're a sinner and you, need, you can't get righteousness on your own. The only way is if you drink this living water that I'm offering you. So she goes back to town excited because of the news that she's got and asks other people to come. And what happens? Many people believe that day. Now, where are the disciples and all this? They've gone to get physical food. There's nothing wrong with that. But let's keep our eyes on spiritual so many times because if we're focused on the physical, we're going to miss the spiritual. 
I'll give you one example, and that's the person you see on the street corner, because there's a lot more of them out there now with the food and the sign. And your first thought is, is ah, if he just changes lifestyle, or whatever your thought is, I'm not putting those thoughts in your mind. When just maybe, just maybe, it's an opportunity to preach the gospel to that Samaritan man or woman. I don't know. All I know is that I get caught up so much in what's going on in my physical, I fail to see the spiritual. And we are beings that are born again by the Spirit of God, to be led by the Spirit of God, to be like Christ in this world. The disciples didn't understand this, and they almost missed seeing the harvest. But Jesus tells them, he says in John chapter 4, verse 34 to 36, then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God. We never saw in the passage there where he ate or drank physically. My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. And we're called to finish what Jesus started. That's why the Gospel of Luke goes on to his continued work of Acts and we see the acts of the Holy Spirit through his people. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. As a result of the woman's faith, however great it was, mustard seed, whatever, she went to the town and told them the best she could. She was not equipped, ready to do this, but she just said, could this be Jesus? Do you want to go back and see with me? And the town came and there was a revival. Why can't you or I do the same thing? Chapter 5, it's the Sabbath. Jesus is in the holy city of Jerusalem, but it's the Sabbath. So the religious, we're back to this, these people that are Nicodemus. Nicodemus is part of one. And there's a man that's been paralyzed there for 38 years. What do the religious people do? They condemn Jesus for healing the man on the Sabbath. Oh, wow. In my own hypocrisy, what, how many t things do I do that I do work on the Sabbath? But I want to neglect helping someone? 38 years this man had been paralyzed. Now notice what's said in the conversation. Jesus says to the man three things. You'll find them in verse 6, 8, and 14. Would you like to get well? Verse 8, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Verse 14, now that you are well, stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. Look at the man's responses. Okay, Jesus said in verse 6, would you like to get well? In verse 7 is the man's response. I can't, sir, for I have no one to, to put me into the pool. So the man realized that he could not be healed on his own. But the man also stated that he needed somebody, a brother or a sister, to help him, didn't he? Or this, he could have possibly already been healed. You can read on more about the story where an angel came down and splashed the water around, and that was the time you could go in and get healing. But that's not the point. The point is, is there are people out there hurting, dying, and they need to know the truth. It'll bring true spiritual healing, and they need someone there to help them. Jesus said, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. It's the Sabbath. The man, the man couldn't stand up. He'd been paralyzed for 38 years. How could he stand up and then pick up your mat? He'd be breaking the Sabbath, and this mat is what I have relied on to sit here and beg. This is my begging mat where I sit and stay. This is my home, so to speak, whatever it is, and then walk. Not just get up, but walk. Whatever it is that God's calling you to do. The man's response is in the next verse. Instantly the man was healed. Is it just like the water into wine when the, the wine was poured? It, it became, uh, when the water was poured, because scripture says the water was poured, that it became wine right at the point of that pouring or when it touched the lips? I mean, first wouldn't I want to, uh, wait a minute, I feel something in my legs. Uh, I, let me see, help me up. No, he stood up, he jumped up implies he immediately stood up. He was immediately changed. Instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and he began walking. No waiting for, what, what did you say exactly, Jesus? Are you sure you want me to help this guy over here? I got things to do today. Are you, you know, no question. The man immediately responded by faith to something that, come on. <laughs> I've been paralyzed for 38 years. This is my income, everything else. 
did I really even want to get in the pool and be healed? Because if I get in the pool and be healed, it's like you offering that person a job so that they can get food and work themselves and eat. Do I really want that? And then in verse 14, now that you are well, stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you. Ooh, that one's kind of difficult. Worse to, because Jesus says, says in Scripture, don't think that things happen because of just the things you've done. Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen. Okay? The response, the man's response was, then the man went and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had healed him. <laughs> he went right to the ones that would cause him the biggest trouble, and he said, it was Jesus. Would you like to come to know him too? Man, what a story. So I have to sit there and say, am I a disciple of Jesus? Am I listening to his words? Am I doing whatever he calls me to do? Or am I questioning it, second-guessing it, making excuses? What am I doing? <clears throat> In verses 21 to 29, For just as the Father gives life to those he raises from the dead, so the Son gives life to anyone he wants. In addition, the Father judges no one. Instead, he has given the Son absolute authority to judge. Oh, I'm back to Revelation and what I was said there. And Jesus has told me to, if I want to be his disciple, if anyone will come to him, I must, must deny myself, take up my cross, and follow after Jesus. Am I doing that? Or am I like the one who put his hand to the plow and I'm longingly looking back and is not fit for the kingdom of heaven? Who am I in Christ? He does this verse 23, so that everyone will honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son is certainly not honoring the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who, who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. He goes on to say, I assure you that the time is coming, and indeed is here now, when the dead will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God, and those who listen will live. The Father has life in himself, and he has granted that same life-giving power to the Son, and he has given him authority to judge everyone because he is the Son of Man. Don't be surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son, and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life. And those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. So I have to ask myself again, am I a follower or a disciple of Jesus Christ or am I a faker? Because at this point, Nicodemus is still a faker if you're reading through him in this story. Chapter 6, huge crowds gather and they are hungry and it's a deserted place. Where are they going to find food? And Jesus asked Philip, knowing what he's going to do, how can we do this, Philip? And Philip's like, well, he don't have enough money to do this, period. And Andrew's faith is kind of like the woman at the well. He's like, well, here's a boy who's got this little bitty lunch, but <laughs> what can be done with so little? If God, if God can use this little one to preach the word boldly, then he can use any one of you. <laughs> Because that's something I would have never desired, never could have done on my own. But you couldn't stop me from proclaiming the word of Jesus Christ now because he's put it in my heart. Jesus feeds the crowds and there is an abundance of leftover. Oh, and we're not talking about physical bread, are we? We're talking about spiritual bread, aren't we? So the chapter goes on. It's a long chapter. But it goes on basically to say there are many, many, many who only want the physical, not the spiritual. They want the healing that, 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 that Jesus can give them for, for being paralyzed. They want the food that you can give them, but they don't want to be changed and follow after this humble king who would give up his life to save others. Jesus says in John 6, 26, I tell you the truth, you want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. Remember what I told you John wrote about these signs? Don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy, your effort, seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. Further on in verse 32, Now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said, give us that bread every day. Do you eat it every day? 
When Jesus was tempted, he said, man must not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I, I constantly have to remind myself of that because I don't skip a meal. <laughs> But some days I skip reading God's Word and meditating on it. Let it nourish me and nourish my soul. <clears throat> Give us that bread every day. And Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me. Hmm. It gets to the point that so many desert Jesus' disciples. That's what the Scripture says, not just people that, that came by wondering, but disciples. That in John 6, verse 67, 68, he, Jesus asked the disciples, the twelve, Are you going to leave? But Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. Have you heard those words? Have you eaten those words? And are you continually hungering and thirsting for Jesus to live in and through you, to know Him, to be intimate with Him? Chapter 7, the bread of life. What does that mean to you? Is it something that fills you and nourishes you every day? Something that you must do to have spiritual life? The festival of booths or tabernacles was going on. And, jo and Jesus' disciples don't get it because they're like, hey, if you're going to be king, you need to go now and, and become popular and do some of these signs here at, at the festival. And Jesus says, my time hasn't yet come. But he's going to come. He's going to come during the, the ceremony. He's going to preach and teach the word. People make their journey or pilgrimage. This is one of the required ceremonies that they go um, to one of the three feasts that they come to celebrate. It's a harvest festival. It's where they set up tents because they realize that they dwell, tabernacle, in this world in a temporary res residence because they're longing for that promised land, not just the promised land that Joshua took the people into, but the promised land of eternal time with God where death has no sting. So they come to celebrate this and make this pilgrimage. Each day of the festival, in the left hand, they hold a citrus fruit. It's called an ertrog. I may or may not pronounce that correctly because there's many, many people who pronounce it differently when you look it up. And in the right hand, they, uh, they pr have a lulav. Okay, it's a palm, a willow, and a myrtle leaf. Okay, and this festival has been going on for, for some time now. The ertrog is God's provision, reminding them of how God provided for them in the desert. And it's shaped like the heart of a man so that we think this way with our heart, with our bowels of mercy. And the lulav represents the journey through the wilderness to the promised land. The palm leaf is shaped like the spine of a man, what you do with your body, <laughs> whether you're spineless or you have integrity to, to, to serve God. The myrtle leaf is shaped like the eyes. Are your eyes filled with the light of Jesus? And the willow leaf like lips. Am I praising God with all I'm doing? So in this celebration, that's what they're doing each day. It's a week-long celebration. Let me remind you, though, what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. A tree is identified by its fruit. We've got a fruit here. If the tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. You brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. And I'm thinking about Nicodemus and this journey so far. A good person produces things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. I ain't thinking about Nicodemus anymore. I'm thinking about Alan. <laughs> the words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. Hmm. What does the backbone of a true believer do? What does a true believer whose eyes are filled with, true, with the true light of Jesus do? What do lips that are truly where their heart is focused on Jesus, what do they say? Where are you at in this story? In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12, So also Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates to make his people holy by means of his own blood. So let us go out to him outside the camp and bear the disgrace he bore. 
For this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise with our lips, with our hearts, with our actions, with our spine, proclaiming our allegiance to His name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. The pr crowds would then follow the priest to the pool of Siloam, waving their hands in the air with the, with the fruit and their, their leaves, the palm leaves and everything. The priest would dip his picture, pitcher into the pool and draw out water and recite from Isaiah chapter 12. See, God has come to save us. I will trust in him and not be afraid. The Lord God is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. With joy you will drink deeply from the fountains of salvation. The crowds would follow the priest back to the temple. A trumpet would sound and the priest would pour out the water onto the altar. All this is going on for several days and the people are wondering as you read that passage, will Jesus show up? Who is Jesus? Where is he at? Some say he's the Messiah. Some say he's a prophet. Some just say he's a mighty man of God. But he's performing all these signs. What are we to believe? And Jesus does show up, doesn't he? But before we go there, what about my heart, my life, my eyes, my lips? Are they totally his or am I divided? Am I serving Jesus with all of these, with all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my soul, all of my strength, until he returns? And am I loving my neighbor as myself? Midway through the festival week, Jesus, begins, or Jesus shows up and begins to preach. And the scripture goes on to say even more that the people are divided. Who is this Jesus? We were wondering if he'd show up. Now we're talking about it among ourselves. Who is he? Listen to the words that he speaks and everything else. Could he be? And then on the last day of the ceremony, the priest would circle around seven times, kind of like Jericho. On the sixth time around, another priest would join in with a celebratory wine. Oh, that first miracle was Jesus turning water into wine. And then on the seventh time around, the priest would hold the pitcher high above his head and the crowd would shout out in praise and adoration of God and the hopes that they have of spending eternity apart from this world in this temporary tent that we reside in and spend eternity in the kingdom of heaven. The priest would begin to pour the water on the altar and the crowd would become silent thinking about this. And it was just at this time, you did it well, Merle, that well, it was quiet. And Jesus stood up and said, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Wow. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink, for the Scriptures declare rivers, not just a river. I'll give you water of life, and rivers will flow out of you. Rivers of living water will flow from your heart. Is that where you're at in this story? That's where we've read through in Scripture so far. Are you born of the Spirit of God? Will you see heaven and enter into it because of your faith in Jesus Christ? So if you have, are your eyes filled? Are your lips proclaiming? Do you have a back, the backbone to give up your desires and everything else and follow after this servant king who gave up his life to save others? Or are you like Nicodemus and you're still hanging out in the shadows saying, hey, I want the light, but I'm afraid of what it might cost me. I'm wealthy. I have these things. I have uh, uh, prestige and everything. And I, 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 I'm, I know the law. I study it. I do all these things. I pay my tithes. Or will you let the light expose you no matter what the cost? And it might mean that not only my fellow uh, religious companions or whatever the words are here they might condemn me they might kill me for following Jesus are you hungry are you thirsty what will Jesus say to you on the day that he meets you face to face anyone who is thirsty have you ever been thirsty I don't know that I've ever been thirsty I've wanted something to drink but I've never been so parched that when that water hit my throat, I thought, ah, that's the water that is giving me life. 
Because without it, I was getting to the point that I was thirsting so much that I would have died if I didn't receive it. Have you ever been that thirsty? And are you that thirsty? That's what Jesus says for the waters of life. No matter what your sin is, what your scandalous things are, what the people of the town are going to think about you, are you going to take what this information is about Jesus with childlike faith and let it change your life where you go back and proclaim to whoever you encounter about the joy that you have received? If I was truly thirsty, I would grab a hold of that water, I would guzzle it down, and I would tell others about that, what I just drank. I challenge you today, and especially as we come into the third week of Advent season, as we come into Christmas, to think about that, especially when you gather together with your family and friends. Yes, it's a time to be with them, and so many times we think about the love and the joy and everything else, but it's all about Jesus Christ and His death, His burial, His resurrection, and His promise to come again and gather together those that are His. And on that day there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth because there are so many that think they are His, but they're like Nicodemus and they're still in the dark relying on their own goodness or whatever it is. So we have to be thirsty and hungry and we have to offer it to others. If there's an altar call to say here, it would be from Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. Has anyone ever heard or heard of anything as strange as this? Has any nation ever traded its gods for new ones, even though they are not gods at all? Yet my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. The heavens are shocked at such a thing. And shrink back in horror and dismay, says the Lord. For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. What is your cistern? I'm trying to say that right. What is your pitcher <laughs> filled with? Is it filled with living water? Because if it's filled with living water, there's no room for anything else in it. It's completely filled with the Spirit. That's what you said at the end of your scripture. There is no room for Satan in there. There's no room for the desires of your flesh. doesn't mean you can't still enjoy a vacation and go off. But it does mean that if you never get a vacation again because you're in a position where you can't and you're serving in Romania and you can maybe never even come home, but because you see the people that have the need that you serve no matter what because that's what God has called you to do. It's whatever God is calling you to do. But if that picture that you have is filled with Jesus Christ and nothing else, then springs of living water will be flowing out of you. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you, not only for this church's name, not only for the people that come and, and give of their time and, and, and talent and effort and, and the unity that we have of the Spirit, but for the opportunity and privilege that we have to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. No matter whether we're in a time of abundance or in a time of need, help us to be children of faith focused on living for you knowing that Jesus is not only enough, He's more than enough. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the beginning and the, and the end. And He is the light that has come in the world to fill us with light, to give us bread that nourishes, nourishes us spiritually to eternal life and to a life that we can live on this earth as a child of God and water that is living for all eternity and able to proceed from us to provide water to others. Help us to be more like what we've read in the Scripture so far, like the woman at the well, rather than the disciples and Nicodemus. She just couldn't keep quiet with what she heard Jesus tell her that day. She didn't understand it or anything else, but she had springs of living water flowing from her because of the good news of Jesus Christ. As we go into this holiday season more and the time that we'll spend with family and friends, Lord, help us to be that light that bread, that living water of Jesus living through us. 
We pray for our family and our friends. You, you have given us the gifts and the heritage and the blessings of children and grandchildren, Lord. Our prayers are that, that none, of, none of them die without knowing you. And you've also given us the responsibility to be the light for them. May our deeds and our attitudes and our heart and our speech proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ as living water to others through this season and then into the next year and until the, until the time when Jesus returns. We pray this in His name. Amen.